Our text this morning is the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, and verses 1 to 8. Verses 1 to 8 in Isaiah 6. The prophet Isaiah writes, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, throughout the last, oh, just about 250 years, the United States has seen 46 presidents. 118 Congresses, 116 Supreme Court Justices. It boasts more economic and military might than any other nation in history. And yet, even now, we still find ourselves facing persistent challenges, don't we? There are proxy wars that we are currently funding while at the same time buried under our own $33 trillion debt. $33 trillion. Inflation is sky high. There's never been a time in our country's history with more people being prescribed psychotropic medication than right now. This reality underscores the fact that our deepest problems cannot be resolved by our own efforts. Consider our current situation. We are witnessing ever-increasing moral decay. Our fundamental problems still remain unchanged. Politicians may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. I'm not suggesting that politics is bad or that we shouldn't engage in the electoral process. Voting is our civic duty. But we must never place our hope in politicians or in politics. To have a correct understanding of ourselves and of the world, we must look beyond the political arena to the one who created it. He is not merely a president. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. And so today I want to consider a nation that was gripped by fear. The people of Judah were very anxious about their future. Threatened by a formidable conqueror, a man named tiglath Pileser III. At the time of the writing of this passage in Isaiah 6, Judah had just lost its beloved king Uzziah. tiglath Pileser, one of history's great conquerors, had swept through the Middle East like Genghis Khan, leaving destruction in his wake. And his grandson, Sennacherib, was poised to lay siege to Jerusalem, and the threat was palpable. What was the nation going to do now that their king was dead? Isaiah 6.1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. Who was King Uzziah? We learn about him in 2 Chronicles 26. King Uzziah became the king of Judah at just 16 years old, and he reigned for 52 years. 52 years. That's longer than Fidel Castro reigned. Think about this. Over the last 52 years, the United States has witnessed the administrations of Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Obama, Trump, and Biden. How many of you were alive when Nixon was president? Most of you. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Most of you. So then, the death of Uzziah would have caused panic around the country. What is going to happen to us now? He was all that most of the people had ever known as a king. And what if Uzziah's son was much worse than him as a leader? What if our enemies overtake us? Woe is me! We're lost! The king is dead! For those in Judah, Uzziah would have been all that they had ever known. And his death was a national tragedy leaving people extremely apprehensive, especially with tiglath Pileser and Sennacherib knocking at the door. Imagine living in a situation where your kingdom is surrounded. It would be like Oak Brook facing imminent conquest with neighboring towns having already fallen. And the steadfast king over five decades is now gone. And now his son Jotham is set to take the throne at just 25 years old. Um, you know, in our country, we have a constitution that stipulates a candidate must be at least 35 years old to run for president. Probably because at 25, most are still figuring out their way in life. And the founding fathers of our country understood that. Jotham, young and inexperienced, raised questions about the future. Would he be a good king? They must have been asking, where do we go from here? Is, is the sun going to lead us well? What direction is our country headed in? This sentiment resonates even today, doesn't it? What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us? It was into this context in the year of King Uzziah's death that God showed his prophet through that though the king might be dead, the king of kings lives forever. Look again at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, and he was high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Isn't it a great comfort to know that even though Uzziah was dead, God is still alive. He's seated on his throne. Psalm 90 in verse 2 proclaims, From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Revelation 1.8 states, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Hebrews 13.8 reassures us, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. This, this is our foundation, friends. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Now I want you to pay attention to three important aspects of verse 1. First, Isaiah refers to God as the Lord I saw the Lord seated on a throne, lofty and exalted. When Isaiah says, I saw the Lord, it's the word Adonai. I saw the Lord. This is a title for God. It means king. It means that he has authority. <clears throat> About 20 years ago or so, I used to, <laughs> when I was bored, I would watch a Scottish television show called Monarch of the Glen. All right. Has anyone here ever heard of Monarch of the Glen? Maybe one or two of you have. The protagonist in the show, a man named Archie, inherits a glen. A glen is like a, I don't know how to describe it. It's, like, it's, a, it's a piece of property. He inherits it and he struggles to maintain it. He often fails. This comedic portrayal reflects our world today where leaders often try to fix our problems, but they fall short. 
In our text, this Hebrew word Lord is different from the Tetragrammaton, where there's all caps. When there's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, D, it is the Hebrew word Yahweh. That's God's proper name. But here, this word means sovereign. I saw the sovereign, the Lord, seated on his throne. Yahweh is God's covenant name. And Adonai, sovereign, emphasizes his control over all things. Verse 1 tells us that Isaiah saw the sovereign king. He affirms that the true king of Israel reigns supreme. In Isaiah 9-7, he says, Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. So first, Isaiah says that the Lord is there. He sees him. Second, Consider what the sovereign king is seated on. Isaiah didn't say, I saw the Lord sitting in an armchair. I saw the Lord sitting on a stool. No, he said, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. Our king is exalted. His throne is higher than any other. What God is doing in the midst of this national crisis when King Uzziah has died is he is reigning from his throne. Is he pacing back and forth? Is he wringing his hands over the nation's troubles? Oh, what's going to happen now? No, he is seated. He's seated. Because he knows exactly what is going to happen and what he is going to do. Third, the last part of verse 1 states that the train of his robe fills the temple. This imagery symbolizes the majesty of God the longer the train of the robe, the more majestic the wearer. Maybe some of you remember when Queen Elizabeth got married many years ago and the train of her dress went all the way down the aisle. There's the symbolic imagery there that she is majestic. She's a majestic queen. Here it says that the train of the Lord's robe is so long it fills the entire temple. One commentator notes that each of these symbols, the title Lord on the throne, the lofty position, the robe filling the temple, they all emphasize God's sovereignty over the universe, all of its kings and nations and peoples. The sovereignty of God is pronounced throughout Isaiah. Nations may turn against him, but his will always prevails. Kings may compete with him, but they will ultimately fall in shame. People may abandon him for idols, yet they cannot escape his judgment. Isaiah leaves no doubt the sovereign Lord writes the script of human history. Amen. He's the one who writes the script of human history. As King David says, every one of my days was written down in your book before one of them ever came to be. And since the Sovereign Lord writes the script of history, and since this is truly His story, we are in His story, then friends, this is where our theology must take the lead. All right? This is where we must preach this to ourselves. This is where we have to meditate on the law of the Lord day and night to really grasp this. We might say, God is in control and I believe it. But what if our chosen candidate doesn't win the office on Tuesday? Then we need to preach this doctrine even more to ourselves. Let us affirm together, we don't have to be afraid. Let's say it together. We don't have to be afraid. One more time. We don't have to be afraid. God's in control, ladies and gentlemen. He is reigning. Do you know where he is right now? The same place where Isaiah saw him, seated on his throne, high and exalted. The train of his robe fills the temple. We don't have to be afraid. Do you believe that God has the power to control history, even to change the hearts of kings and presidents? We should, because he's the sovereign God. Look at verses 2 and 3. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And they called to one another and said, Holy, 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 kadosh, 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 
is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In these verses, we're introduced to the seraphim. That word seraphim means burning ones. These are angels whose job from the time they were created until now has been to do what they are doing here. To proclaim the holiness of God forever and ever. And the glory of God forever and ever. Here are those burning ones hovering before the throne of God. And the text says they have six wings. With two wings they covered their face. But, but why? Why did they cover their face? These angels though certainly not sinful angels, cover their eyes because they cannot look directly at God. God dwells in unapproachable light. They cover their feet because they recognize their own creatureliness and the fact that the distance in nature between God and even these seraphim is vast. God is God and they are creatures. And they're flying and calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This is the only attribute of God that is repeated three times in the Bible. God is not just holy. He is not just holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. He is infinitely holy. He is absolutely holy. He is set apart going to talk a little bit more about what that means in just a moment. And this thrice holy God is the Lord of hosts. He's the commander of hosts. When I was a young Christian, I read this passage. I thought, what is a host? The only thing I knew about a host was like, that's what I did for a job one time when I was a teenager. I was a host. <laughs> host in this context means armies. He's the Lord of the armies of heaven. He is omnipotent. That's the point that's being made here. He's omnipotent. He is infinite and transcendent. And even the seraphim recognize this absolute holiness. They cannot even look directly at him because of his radiance. And when they cry these things in verse 4 and 5, it says, And the foundation of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. I mean, what an awesome sight that is. <clears throat> and Isaiah's reaction is this. Woe is me! I'm ruined! Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies. What a picture of power is here portrayed. Why does Isaiah say, woe is me for I am ruined? Well, because the Bible says that no man can see God and live. That's why. That's why, That's why the angels were covering their faces. No man can see God and live. I'm ruined, he says. I've seen the king. I'm ruined. Even the angels cannot look upon him. Woe, that word woe, is the root word of a Yiddish saying that my grandma would sometimes say, which is this, oy vey. It's the root of oy vey. When do you say oy vey? Well, she would say like this, don't go outside, it's snowing. If you're driving in the snow, you could get in a crash, oy vey. Whoa, how terrible that would be. Means <clears throat> that... He cries out, oy vey, because he's saying, I'm unraveled. I'm finished. I'm done. I'm a sinner. In this text in Isaiah 6, we see not just the creature-creator distinction, but also how much more the distinction between the holy, holy, holy creator God and the sinful creator how much more a distinction there is. Ever since the events of Genesis 3, when Adam ate from the forbidden tree, man has been sinful. Angels may not be sinful, but they're still creatures which cannot even look upon God. And so how much more is the destruction which is about to come upon Isaiah, or so Isaiah thinks? In verse 5, he's reacting to seeing God by 
feeling utterly undone and unraveled in the presence of the Lord. Friends, this displays for us how serious a thing it is to stand before God and really how little, I would even say, the vast majority of the capital C church in our context today, perhaps not in our particular church, but the, the church in the West at least, how, how little the church in the West really thinks about this, the holiness of God True. and what it is to stand before God. And so instead of taking the worship of God seriously and uh, uh, being sober-minded as we worship him, as we meditate on him, the church in so many areas has just become a circus act. It's because they need this picture. They don't have this picture. They don't see God like this. We need to go get back to this to understand God is holy. Isaiah's own reaction shows us this truth and highlights the contrast between his own sinfulness and God's purity. Isaiah acknowledges his unclean lips, which is a remarkable admission given his prophetic role. His awareness of sin becomes painfully clear. Why does Isaiah focus on his lips? He says, woe is me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when he says, I have unclean lips, what he's really confessing is, I'm an unclean man. I have an unclean heart. Unclean lips show this. This is what Isaiah was confessing. Woe is me, I'm ruined because I'm a sinner. I'm lost. What can be done for me? I've seen God. Before we see God's reply, we have to understand that God's holiness is not just about his being set apart. His holiness encompasses his righteousness, his absolute purity, his justice, his goodness. And so every sin that we ever commit is infinitely heinous against the backdrop of such a great and holy God. There are no little sins because there is no little God to sin against. And this is why Isaiah says that he's undone. And he says, not only him. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. In other words, it's not just them out there, those Gentiles, those sinners in other places. He's saying, we all corporately have unclean lips, and thus an unclean heart. We do. We need the Lord. We need his grace. Amen. This is about us. The wrath of God against sinners is real. And we have to re reckon with that wrath. Leon Morris writes, Unpalatable though it may be, our sins, my sins, are the object of the wrath of God. And if we are taking our Bible seriously, we must realize that every sin is displeasing to God and that, and that unless something is done about the evil that we've committed, unless we are cleansed somehow, how can we be cleansed? There's only one way. Unless we're cleansed somehow, we face ultimately nothing less than the divine anger and judgment. Isaiah's sin was laid bare before him when he caught a glimpse of the Lord. When he saw the seraphim covered their faces in order not to see. And friends, everyone must confront the reality that God is holy and we are not. We either face this reality now in this life or eventually we will face it in the end. When I came to my own conversion to Christianity, when the Lord graciously saved me, I had a moment of realization that I'm a wicked person. And I felt like God had every right to destroy me for the way that I had lived my life. Just as Isaiah felt, ruined, undone. That sense of being laid bare before the holy God. That is necessary if there is to be any hope of salvation from our sin. We must first recognize this about ourselves. Isaiah needed cleansing, and we need cleansing. We need it. And before the holy God, everyone must humble themselves 
fall on their faces, either now by choice or in judgment on the final day. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Bill Clinton will do that. Donald Trump will do it. Kamala Harris, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Martha Stewart, Kim Jong-il, you and me and every one of us will stand before God in the judgment Isaiah had broken God's holy commandments, and in that moment he recognized his ruin. How tragic it would be if the text stopped right there. <laughs> oh no, that's it? Is there no hope at all? But there is, thank God. Look at verses 6 to 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin forgiven. Do you know, this is a hard text to preach, this Isaiah 6. It's hard to preach it, because, because usually when I get up here, I bring about four pages of notes, and that lasts me as long as it lasts me, right? I wrote eight pages of notes for this sermon, and I still feel like, uh-oh, it's not long enough. It's not, but I'm going to finish here quick, right? quickly, okay? You don't have to be afraid of that. There's just so much here, so much amazing imagery, it's beautiful imagery. The seraphim had to have acted under God's command. I mean, do you think that they have much autonomy, those seraphim there, who are around the throne of God constantly crying out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory, all day long, every single day for all eternity? Like, I don't think that they have much autonomy. So they're sent, the angel is sent, and he brings to Isaiah this instrument of his atonement. Isaiah thinks that he's ruined, that he's going to die. Because our God is a consuming fire. So then, how is Isaiah's sin atoned for? Look at it. One of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand. But where did he take the coal from? From the altar. The altar? What happens on the altar? It's where the sacrifices are made. Right? The fiery coal touches Isaiah but it does not consume him, rather it purifies and atones for him. It was a live coal, a, a burning coal. What did that feel like? To be touched on the mouth with a burning coal from the altar of God. The text does not tell us. Instead of washing out Isaiah's mouth with soap, God purges his mouth with a fiery coal from the altar of atonement. Eight centuries after Isaiah's proclamation, two men went to the temple to pray. One boasted of his deeds. Look at all that I have done. I fast, I give, I'm not like that other man over there. In contrast, the tax collector beat his breast, unable even to look up, and he pled, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. In other words, it is the same that we can see over and over again throughout history that those who are saved first come to a knowledge of their own desperate need of salvation. And only then does the Lord provide it for them. And Jesus says that that man went home justified. So the angel did that for Isaiah here. He touched his mouth with the burning coal. It was symbolic. It was from the altar where atonement was made. Everything here was designed to bring Isaiah to misery before he could be used by God. And seeing the Lord here does not destroy Isaiah, but it restores him. The coal from the sacrificial altar touched his lips Therefore, the vision of the Lord on his throne was not given for the purpose of Isaiah's destruction, but for his atonement and his reconciliation and restoration. We see here the hopelessness of trusting in kings because the king was dead. The foolishness of trusting in angels because even they cannot look upon the magnificence of God. Or the foolishness of trusting in oneself, because all are men of unclean lips and dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. We cannot trust in anyone else but Jesus. 
And when he trusts in the Lord, when the Lord takes away his sins, then he hears the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Why does he say, send me? Because his sins were atoned for by the Lord. And in recognition and thankfulness of that, he wants to be used by the Lord. He recognized his sin and he experienced atonement. And he trusted in Jesus. And now if you might say, well, that's taking a lot from that, that he trusted in Jesus. Um, are you sure that he trusted in Jesus? Yes, absolutely. Because in Isaiah chapter 53, the same book, he says this, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds. We are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. I, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. We all have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yes, Isaiah trusted in Jesus. Yes, it was Jesus that he saw sitting on the throne. It was Jesus. That's who he was looking at, a pre-incarnate Jesus. There's a sense in which Isaiah 6 is a, a theophany, a theophanic vision. He sees a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ sitting on the throne from all eternity, and he's the sovereign one. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, to reconcile us, to make us holy. This same one, the king of the universe, the king of kings, had the inscription king of the Jews placed above him on the cross. Isaiah sees the pre-incarnate Christ on the throne, and when he says, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, he's referring to Christ Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. If you confess Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And this atonement was made by Jesus. It's the same for those who are in the Old Testament looking forward toward him and we now who are looking back in the past. And we have no righteousness of our own before the holy God. All we can do is cry out, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. So I want to close by saying a couple of things to you now. This reality is far more important than what's going to happen in the next two days. Far more important. You possess an eternal soul that will live forever. Your body will die, but your soul will continue. Eventually, your body will be raised to life again. If you trust in Christ, you will go on to eternal bliss in heaven. Um, but we will all stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And as your pastor, I urge you to focus on eternal matters. Focus there more than on temporal things. And I think that we all should vote this week. But shift your gaze away from this election. It is not where our primary concern as believers in Jesus should lie. In Joshua 5, Joshua encounters a man who with a sword and asks, Are you for us or against us? And the man replies, Neither am I. Neither. I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Instead, we should be asking, what message does the Lord have for me? What does he want to say to me? Where does he want to send me? Where should I go with the words of life? Where should I go to proclaim the gospel of Christ? And if that is our focus, then we can sing like Horatio Spafford, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And no matter what happens, even when King Uzziah died, the Lord was still in control. Even somebody gets in, into the office on Tuesday, whether they do or whether they don't, the Lord is still in control. We will be okay. Our church will. We are God's church. We're pilgrims in this world. This world is not our home. It's merely a hotel. 
Some of us may mistakenly believe that this hotel is our permanent residence because it feels comfortable sometimes, but we have a mansion waiting for us in eternity, and it's crucial that we maintain this perspective. The only true woe, friends, is if you stand before God and your sins are not atoned for. And if you've experienced this transformation that Isaiah did, this atonement, then let us reflect on the words of Isaiah 6, 8 together. We hear the voice of the Lord asking, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Here am I, Lord. Send me. Isaiah experienced such a profound salvation that he dedicated his life to God's purpose. If you have had a similar encounter with the Lord, you will see the urgent need around us. Billions do not know Jesus Christ. Many, many thousands in our own community do not know him. Millions in our country are headed toward a Christless eternity. If we directed even half of our energy that we do on other things into sharing God's truth and preaching the gospel, and loving our neighbor in that way, what a different country this place would be. God sent his son for us. Why not give him your life in return? We can echo the hymn writer's words before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is written on his hands. My name is graven on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, give us this atonement that you gave to Isaiah. We're so grateful for it. We know that it, we can only find atonement in Jesus Christ and his blood shed for us. Thank you, Lord, that you did not leave him in this place of despair, but reconciled him to you. And you have done so for all who believe in you. Help us to be focused on what truly, really matters. Help us to pray for our country. Help us to not be afraid no matter what, Lord. We ask that you would be with us now, that you would be with the United States of America, that you would bring true revival here to our country. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing. In your bulletin you'll find this world is not my home. Let's stand and sing together. Are we having communion? Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. We're going to do communion <laughs> first. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Before we sing and close, we're going to take communion. If your sins have been atoned for, if the Lord has proverbially touched you with the burning coal from the altar, the Lord has removed your sin through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If he has done that, then you may take of this cup and the bread. These things are the symbol of what Jesus Christ has done for us. It is the sign of the new covenant. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. And we take it together we take it at the same time together in an acknowledgement that I am in just as desperate need of God's grace and mercy as Isaiah was and as my neighbor sitting next to me is as well. I'm in just as desperate need as they are. That's why we take the communion at the same time. We might acknowledge this. I need Jesus. You need Jesus. We all do. Probably too late to play a song right now, is it? Okay, maybe you could play something.
The Apostle Paul was also someone who was wrecked by a sight of Jesus. He saw Jesus, and he himself felt utterly ruined by it. And then Jesus atoned for him and called him to himself and then sent him out as his apostle. And it's that same apostle Paul who received the grace of Jesus. He's the one who writes these words. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Oh Lord, we thank you so much that you have provided atonement for people of unclean lips like we are and unclean hearts like we have. That you have covered them over and cleansed us of our sin and drawn us to yourself and even send us out as your ambassadors. We're so grateful for that, Lord. And we worship you now in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Inside of your bulletin, you'll find the hymn, This World is Not My Home. Let us stand together and sing. Thank you.
God, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. May God be with you all.